Hi everybody and welcome back to room 9, our region's largest classroom. My name is Miss St. Louis and I'm a teacher at Rogers Elementary School in the Melville School District and we are located in South St. Louis County. Today I'm here to teach a reading lesson that's geared towards students who are in the third grade but all learners are more than welcome to learn and explore along with us. So let's get started. This week we are going to be talking about all things poetry. And so we are going to be exploring different types of poems, different elements of poetry, and breaking down poems to see what they're all about. So today we are going to be talking about a specific type of poem and the structures in which poetry is built around. So let's jump into different types of poems. First, when we talk about different types of poems, there are six basic types of poems that we're going to go over today. The first are lyrical poems, and those are very song-like. They can express thoughts and feelings, and they can have rhyme. Oftentimes, when you talk to an artist who writes their own songs, they might start by writing poetry, and that poetry turns into a song. So if you ever have a chance to talk with an artist, ask them about their process and how did they come up with their song? You might find that they started with a lyrical poem and that's how their writing process is. Another type of poem we have are narrative programs. Now you might have heard that word before because we use that word when we are talking about writing, right? We have personal narratives that we talk about in writing, and those are stories about ourselves. So a narrative tells a story, and it'll have story elements, like characters and settings, and it'll have a plot, right? A problem and a solution. It'll also um, usually have some rhythm, and it can rhyme, okay? So it's gonna tell a story, but through a poem. Now, I can think of some books that my, I have read in our, my class that are narrative poems, right? And sometimes you'll notice when a teacher is reading a read aloud and you'll think in your head and you go, oh my goodness, this poem is rhyming or this book is rhyming. And you might come to realize that it's not just a book, that it is a narrative poem. And sometimes we don't realize that until we've already started to read the book. Another type of poem is a free verse poem. Now, this poem has no set rules, no set rhythm, and it won't follow a rhyming scheme, right? So remember, rhyming schemes, and we'll, we'll talk about these again in a second, right, are some of those patterns that we see when we talk about rhymes. So when we say free verse, we mean that we have freedom, there are no rules, we are just writing our own poetry, okay? So it's very free and different. It doesn't follow that set structure that we might be used to in poems that we've read before. Another type of poem is a limerick. Now, limericks are oftentimes humorous or silly. They typically have five lines and they have an A-A-B-B-A -B -B -A rhyme scheme. So remember, the letters refer to the lines. Right, so we have five lines and we'll have an A, A, B, B, A. So those that are A's, their last word will rhyme and those that are B's, their last word will rhyme, okay? And now the key to that is that they're oftentimes very silly poems. Then we have the haiku. Now a haiku has three lines and it is very structured. So it has a syllable pattern. Five, seven, five. Now, when we talk about syllables, it's how we break down words, right? So oftentimes when we're talking about syllables, we might clap out the syllables, right? Those sound sets that we hear. So for example, if I wanted to find out how many syllables were in the word haiku, I could say haiku. So there are two syllables in that word. So when we're writing a haiku poem, we're looking at the syllables in each line. So it has five syllables in the first line, then seven syllables in the second line, followed by five more syllables in the last line. 
and it's usually about nature, right? So oftentimes when we see haiku poems, they might be about the seasons or maybe about weather patterns, right? So we're talking about nature with those. And the last type of poem that we're going to talk about is a sinquang. And that has five lines and it has the syllable pattern of two, four, six, eight, two. Okay. So again, we're dealing with those syllables. Okay. And so, right, clapping out those syllables, but this one, right, having five lines is doing the two, four, six, eight, two. Now with this poem, we do not see rhyming with this poem, right? So we're not looking for those lines to rhyme. We're just looking at the syllable pattern with this one. So these are the basic types of poems that we're going to see. All right. And that we'll talk about, we might not see all of them, but we'll see most of them. But let's get in a little bit further into the elements of poetry. Now there's a lot of elements of poetry. I know this is a lot. So we're going to break it down step by step, piece by piece. And then we're going to look at some poems and see if we can identify some of these different features. So to start, um, when we talk about poetry, there's always a speaker or a voice of the poem. Okay. And so that's usually telling our point of view. And so we've talked a little bit about point of view before and point of view, right? Is that perspective from which the story is being given. And so we can look for some of those key words in the poem to help tell us what point of view we are looking from. So if we're talking about first person point of view, we might see key words like I and me, right? It's you telling the story. If it's second person point of view, we'll see words like you and your. And if it's third person, we'll see words like he, she, they. Okay. So that can give us an idea of who is talking in the story, right? Is it a character, a narrator? Who is telling the story? And also from what perspective are they telling the story? Because as we've talked about before, different people have different perspectives on situations. So that can give us some insight into a little bit of the background of the story. Now, when we talk about how a poem is made up, we have lines and stanzas. Now lines are single rows of words in a poem. Right? It is a single line. If you look at it, you can draw a line right across. And so when we put groups of lines together, we come up with stanzas. And so sometimes stanzas, stanzas will have a meter or rhyme scheme, right? They'll have a rhythm with them or some, or a rhyme scheme. So here we can see a line could be Samson is a studious snake. That's a line in a poem. But it, the stanza of that poem is Samson is a studious snake who loves to read for fun. He checked out far too many books. Now his backpack weighs a ton. Right? So that stanza has four lines in it. Okay? And so those lines are built together. You can kind of think of it when we talk about paragraphs in writing. So in writing, we put sentences together to create paragraphs. In poetry, we put lines together to create stanzas. Okay, so let's look at our first poem for today and see if we can identify some lines and stanzas. So the book that we're reading from today is called Miguel's Brave Night. Okay, and it's a collection of poems by Margarita Engel. So these poems all work together to tell a story, almost a bit like a narrative, but it's broken down into different sets of poems. And so those poems work together to tell the story of Miguel. Okay. So here's our first poem, Happiness. When I close my eyes, I ride up high on a horse, the color of moonrise. 
But then I open my eyes and all I see is Papa selling the last of the horses from his stable. His sweet old swayback nag, a tired animal that would be happy to sleep all day. With eyes shut tight again, I picture a galloping steed that will carry Papa's sadness away. So that is our poem. We'll double check, make sure. See, the next page is a different poem that continues our story. But let's look here. Okay, so we have lots of lines. We can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So this poem has sixteen lines. Now let's look at the stanzas. We have one, two, three. Three stanzas in this poem. Now You'll notice that the author, right, when he writes his lines, and even when he writes his stanzas, they're all different lengths. Here we can see a line that's two words or one word. This one up here has seven words, right? So the when you write your poem, you have to think about how long you want your lines to be, right? And also how long do you want your stanzas to be, okay? So that's something to keep in mind when we are writing. Now, another thing to think about when we are writing is rhyme and rhyme scheme. Now, rhyming are words that have the same ending sound, right? So if we think about the word, hmm, book, what are some words that you can think of that rhyme with book? Look, took, shook, Nook, hook, oh my goodness, so many words, right? So all of those words have that same ending sound, book, okay? So when we talk about rhyming words, that's what we're referring to, words that have the same ending sound. Now, we can put those together to create a rhyme scheme, and that's a pattern of lines that rhyme with other lines, okay? And it helps to create a rhythm in our poem, okay? So when we talk about rhyming, not every word in a line has to rhyme. We're looking at the last word in each line and those rhyme. And we can put those together to create patterns. So when we talk about a pattern like an ABAB pattern, that means that the first and third line, the last words will rhyme. And with the second and fourth line, those last words will rhyme. That's an ABAB. You could have an A-A-B-B -B or an A-B-A-C, right? There's so many different patterns that um, authors of poems can come up with that help to create different rhythm feels, right? So they do that for a reason. So let's look at a little excerpt and see if you can identify what pattern we see. Samson is a studio snake who loves to read for fun. He checked up far too many books. Now his backpack weighs a ton. What did you notice there? Yeah, we heard that fun and ton rhyme, right? So we have that second and fourth line, those ones rhyme. Very good. So let's look at a poem and see if we can identify any rhyming. Let me find a good one. Now, not all of them have rhyming, which is what I have found is very hard in this book. Let's see, let's, let's read this poem and see. You tell me, does it have any rhyming patterns? A new life. I am older now. In Madrid, I study with a teacher who chooses four of my poems to be published in a book, a real book, solid and heavy in my hands, powerful and permanent with pages shaped like open doorways. Some daydreams really do come true. Did you hear any rhyming in that poem? Yeah, I didn't hear any rhyming in that poem either. Hmm. Why do you think an 
author would choose not to use rhyme. Yeah, and so sometimes I think that we get it in our heads that poems have to rhyme. And I know oftentimes when I write my own poetry, I think in my head, oh, I've got to have some rhyme. I've got to have some rhyme. But that's not always the case, right? When we talked about one of our examples of poetry, which was a lyrical poem, think about songs, right? And the songs that we sing and the songs that we hear on the radio. They don't always have rhyming words in them at the end of those lines. And so authors, right, choose their words very carefully and rhyming can help to create a rhythm, but we can still create a rhythm without having that rhyme, okay? Um, so know that, know that that can make a difference and authors don't have to choose rhyme. So the author here, Margarita Engel, she chose not to use any rhyming with her poems, right? And so she made a decision why to do that. Now, unfortunately, I don't know Margarita, so I can't ask her that, right? But that would be a question that you can think of to ask someone if you ever meet an author of some poems and ask them why they make the choice to either make their words rhyme or not, okay? Something to think about. Now, another thing we think about with poems is mood. Now, mood is when we create feelings and emotions in a reader through the words and descriptions, right? So mood is really important because poems were written for a reason. And oftentimes they were written to help get you to feel, okay? So when we tell our poems, they're written for a reason, right? Songs are written for a reason. We want you to feel happy or sad, Maybe we want you to feel excited or nervous. So the words that we choose help to create mood. So let's see if we can identify the mood of one of these poems. All right. Stories. With my sisters, it's easy to pretend that the tales mama tells are real. We act out each scene, creating little plays filled with dragons and heroes. I wear Papa's barber bowl on my head and hold Mama's broom high. I am a knight on a steed, armed with a golden helmet and a glowing lance. Happiness surrounds me as I prance and gallop into my fanciful world of brave deeds. Hmm, what do you think the mood is here? What's the feeling that's going on? Maybe happy, playful, right? It's a very upbeat mood that we see in this poem. Whereas some poems, they may not have as happy of a mood. So let's see if we can identify the mood for this poem. Disaster. No more smiles. This is a plague year. Disease, famine, terror. No school, no teacher, no books, just sorrowful prayers. But I still carry invisible stories in my head. My daydream tales help calm my worries. Hmm, what's the mood of that poem? Yeah, it's very sad, right? It's not an upbeat, Home, right? We're not using good words, right? We use the word no a lot. And no, right, has that negative connotation, right? When we think of the word no, we think of none, right? That's a bad word. So um, the author chose to use the words here, right? And that elicited that mood of feeling really sad, okay? Now, some other things that we have in poetry are imagery which is when we use descriptive language to create mental images that often appeal to our five senses, right? Sound, taste, smell, sight, and touch, okay? So with imagery, I often like to close my eyes, 
right? And see if I can paint a picture in my head of what the author is trying to get across with imagery, right? What is the author trying to get me to see? So I want to read you this poem and see if you can make a mental image in your head. So you might want to close your eyes and see if you can make a picture in your mind. This is called Comfort. Bare rooms, blank walls. Our empty house looks so spooky and stark. But when I close my eyes, the spark of a story flares up. A tale about a brave knight who will ride out on a strong horse and right all the wrongs of this confusing world. Were you able to create an image in your head? Yeah, they use some really good words here, right? The house looks spooky, right? So now I'm starting to think of dark colors when I think of a spooky house, right? Shadows, maybe cobwebs and stark, right? It's blank, okay? Bare rooms, blank walls. So I'm starting to be able to create this image in my head of what's going on. Now, authors also use sound devices, right? Which are words that create sound and enhance the rhythm, right? So that's rhythm, repetition, alliteration, and onomatopoeia. And they also use figurative language which is when we use words or phrases to mean something other than their literal meaning, okay? So that's things like similes, metaphors, hyperboles, and personification. So tomorrow, we're gonna dive in deep to those because there are so many pieces when it comes to figurative language and sound devices. It's huge. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at one more poem and see if we can do a lot of these elements, find a lot of these elements of poetry in it. Okay, let's read this poem. Smoke. Out in the plaza, I sniff the dark air, a huge pile of books, the sad scent of each fiery flare. When I ask Mama why they are burning these books, she says it is against the law to write stories from one's imagination. But how can anyone burn precious books when our school has so few and my mind craves so many? My brave knight would rescue the flaming pages. So, hmm. when we talk about the speaker, how is this being written? First, second, or third person point of view. Very good, it's written in first person, right? We see that word, I, out in the plaza, I sniff the dark air. So this is being written from Miguel's point of view. And Miguel is that main character we're talking about in this book. So we see our lines and we see different stanzas here, okay? Was there any rhyming in this poem? Not really, no. So there's really no rhyme scheme that we can see. Now, what about the mood, okay? What feelings or emotions is the author trying to send out with this poem? Yeah, it, it is kind of sad, right? In this poem, right, they're burning these books and Miguel, that makes Miguel very sad. His school doesn't have a lot of books, so he doesn't understand why people would go off and burn books when they don't even have enough as it is. And at the end, you can see that he says, my brave knight would rescue the flaming pages, right? So he believes that his knight, right, the knight that he has created in his own mind would be there and would be able to rescue those pages. Okay. Now, what about imagery? Were you able to create a mental image in your head? Yeah, look at this, look at the beginning. It's, it's got a lot of imagery in it, right? Out in the plaza, I sniff the dark air. A huge pile of books, the sad scent of each fiery flare, right? So we can start to think about, hmm. What might that look like? What might that smell like, right? What would we be experiencing if we were actually there? Very cool. 
So this book, Miguel's Brave Night, okay, explores Miguel's story. Okay, so in case you ever want to check it out, I want to read it to you. Okay, a little bit about this collection of poems. So Miguel is the son of a vagabond barber surgeon who squandered away his family's money. Miguel has had a difficult childhood, but he has found refuge from his troubles by daydreaming of dragons and imagining a brave knight who would right the wrongs of the world. Young Miguel was inspired by the storytellers and wandering actors who performed during festivals, and he longed to tell stories of his own. Although his family was forced to move often to escape the debt collectors, debt collectors, Miguel managed to attend school from time to time and learned to read and write. When he was 19, one of his teachers had four of Miguel's poems published. This imaginative young boy was destined to become one of the greatest writers in the Spanish language. So here you can see, this is even a bit of a poem about the stories of Miguel, right? And his dream, okay? So this might be a really cool book to check out if you want to learn a little bit about some of the history of some of the, some really good poems, okay? So I would recommend this book. Now, boys and girls, to recap, today we talked about different kinds of poems, right? We have, uh-oh, different types of poems that we see. Um, and so today we explored the narrative type of poems, right, that tells a story, okay? And then we also went through some of those big elements that we find when we talk about poetry. Um, that help to make poems what they are. Because without these elements, we wouldn't have a poem. We would have a different type of writing. So I hope that you come back tomorrow and join us as we explore sound devices and figurative language and poetry. And until you, I see you again next time, I hope that you guys have a really great rest of your day and I hope that you have fun. Bye everybody. in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.